دعوني بداية أرحب بكم جميعا طلابا أعضاء التدريس مؤسسة الجامعة عندما تم اقتراح عقد هذا اللقاء في شهر رمضان بعض الناس قالوا لا مش مناسب وانا اصريت قلت لهم لا يعني شو الفرق المفروض يكون في رمضان رمضان ما اشرب بما اعتقدش كيف ما انا فاهمينها بتاع رقاد وبتاع سهول وبتاع وكان واجد وقله عمل للاسف حتى الدوله تمارس في هذا العمل لما تعطل المدارس بحجه ان المدرسات باش يقدر يديرن في براك وصلاطه و وبابا غنوش اعتقد ان هذه مخجله ان ان المدارس تعطل اه العيال يقعدوا في الماء والعام الدراسي يقلص الى ثلاثة اشهر كارثه وخاصه لما تمارسها الدوله نفسها احنا قلنا لا كما ان نسجل في كل مره اننا مختلفين كنا نريد ان نثبت ان ايضا في هذه المناسبه مختلفين مجلس الجامعه امس الساعه 10 صباحا في الموعد المقرر للاجتماع كانوا كل اعضاء مجلس الجامعه حاضرين ولم يتاخر بدايه الاجتماع دقيقه واحده وما اعتقدش هذاك الوقت كانوا عشرات الالاف من الليبيين نايمين وكنا احنا الساعه 10 بالضبط كما هو مقرر كل اعضاء مجلس الجامعه في اماكنهم وبدا النقاش كنا نتوقع ان هذا اليوم ما هذا نبدو نبدو قلنا 10 نبدو 10 كل الناس اللي سواء اللي مقدمين البحوث ولا اللي جاي بنحضر ونحضر نفس الموعد بدايه انا اسجل اعتذاري عن اي تاخير وعن اي ازعاجات ممكن تصير والاعتراف بالخطا فضيله أنا لست راضيا عن الترتيبات اللي دارت في هذا في هذا اليوم، كان المفروض كان في ترتيب أحسن. الدكتور محمد بدري قال لي كيف المفروض الجامعة كلها فيها ما يدل على أن أن فيه يوم علمي للجامعة. منشورات ودعاية و بلكي حتى المفروض يعني ناس تحكي هيك ما تمش هذا وهذا خطا الجماعه ارسلوا الاشعارات عن طريق المنظومه وكثير مننا لعلهم ما طلعوش عليها واعتقد ان المنظومه مش كافيه في كل الاحوال التحيه لكل الطلاب واعضاء التدريس اللي كانت لهم مساهماتهم العلميه اولا في كلياتهم لان نحن اللي حنستعرضوه اليوم هي نتائج بحوث ودراسات قاموا بها الطلاب في كلياتهم وكانوا متميزين والان استعرضوها على مستوى الجامعه. كثير من الناس حسب ما بلغوني بعض منهم خاصه في كليه الاي تي متخرجين وما قدروش كيف يتواصلوا معهم وهذه كانت مسؤوليه الكليه. اتمنى ان نحن الجماعه اللي بتقدموا يلتزموننا بالوقت بدينا متاخر وما نبوش نتاخروا اكثر من اللازم دعونا بدايه نستمع للدكتور محمد سعد رئيس الجامعه في كلمه بالمناسبه انا تعودنا السنتين الماضيتين الجمهور العلمي تم عن طريق وسائل التواصل الالكتروني يعني ان شاء الله نتمنى ان الله سبحانه وتعالى يحفظ البلاد والعباد من هذه الجائحه ومن كل الاخطار واحنا بالتاكيد يعني ممتنين جدا 
وصول لهذه النتيجة إن إحنا الآن نستعرض في أوراق عمل وأبحاث وإنتاج عمل قاموا به الطلاب نحن من ضمن المستهلكين للمعرفة لكي نصل إلى إنتاج المعرفة لم تأتي بمجرد الأمنيات والرغبات وحتى توفير توفير الموارد والأموال ليس هذا هو الأساس يقول خبراء المعرفة يقولوا للوصول إلى إنتاج المعرفة لابد من أن نحسن إدارة المعرفة إدارة المعرفة ليس فقط في توفير الموارد ولا بما فيها يعني الموارد المادية والبشرية أعتقد بأن الجزء الأهم الذي بدأ في هذه المؤسسة في هذه الجامعة الفتية الطموحة أن نحن بدأنا فعلا بالتفكير في كيفية إدارة المعارف ليس فقط في يعني توفير الموارد وهذه راهي لعلم كم في ميزانية هذا العام خصص مبلغ لا بأس به يعني لا يرتقي إلى طموحاتنا ولكن لا بأس به للبحث العلمي ليس ذلك فقط يعني إحنا عندما كنا نتحدث على التعلم الذات المرشد والتعلم عن طريق البحث investigative based learning كنا يعني ندعو إلى وضع أساس للبحث العلمي وتطوير آليات البحث العلمي وخلق الذهنية التي يعني تهتم بالبحث العلمي ربما يعني ونقول دائما يعني أك يعني أكبر موارد هذا البلد وأكثر يعني شيء ممكن نعتمد عليه هو عقول أبنائه يعني إحنا متأكدين من أن عقولنا لا تقل عقول أبنائنا لا تقل على غيرهم في الدول المنتجة للمعرفة الدول اللي فيها تطور وفيها تقدم علمي وفيها يعني الدول اللي فيها براءات الاختراع هي تلك الدول اللي الآن اقتصاداتها قوية هي تلك الدول التي تمتلك القوة العسكرية والمادية والاقتصادية واللي تتنافس فيما بينها يعني إحنا ما نراها الآن من صراع يعني العالم لم ينضج مازال يعني هذا الصراع القائم الآن سواء في أوكرانيا ولا في جه في في الخليج ولا في بحر الصين وفي جنوب شرق آسيا وبين أوروبا وأمريكا فيه تنافس تنافس شديد والتنافس راهو في الأساس على في المعرفة تلك الدول اللي استطاعت أن تنافس هي التي امتلكت المعرفة يعني لا يمكننا أن نحدث أي تغيير حقيقي إلا إذا امتلكنا المعرفة وإمكانيات إنتاج المعرفة على حال إحنا اليوم راهو جزء من من هذا الخيار إن نحن لا نريد أن نقف على قارعة الطريق لا نريد أن نبقى ونستمر مشاهدين ومتفرجين لا نريد أن نبقى أيضا ساعة لصراع الآخرين إحنا عندما يعني نؤكد هذه المفاهيم والمبادئ إحنا راه يعني يعني نتوق إلى تحقيق مكنة ومقدرة وحياة كريمة لشعبنا ولأولادنا ولمستقبلنا وكذلك لا نستهين بقدراتنا إحنا مرات يعني نعتقد بأن إحنا جامعة صغيرة ويعني عمرها أيضا قصير و يعني إمكانياتها يعني بالكاد هي تذكر مقارنة بإمكانيات جامعات أخرى وغيرها لكن هذا غير صحيح غير صحيح إطلاقا لو كان الجامعات تقاس بالقدم لكانت جامعة الزيتونة وجامعة الأزهر وممكن حتى جامعة بولونيا هي الأفضل في العالم لو كان تقاس بالحجم لكانت يعني جامعات إحنا نعرفها تماما في الجوار دار هي هي الأفضل في العالم 
المشهد لا تقاس لا بالحجم ولا بالعمر تقاس بالجهد بما يبذل من جهد انا متاكد من ان يعني لديكم معلومات وافيه ان افضل الجامعات في العالم اللي تذكر الان سواء كان هارفارد ولا الام اي تي ولا ستانفورد ولا يعني على سبيل المثال جامعات خاصه وجامعات صغيره وليست يعني نحكوا على يعني عمر اقل بكثير صحيح ممكن جامعه زي جامعه اوكسفورد ولا يعني من القدم والمكان لكنها حافظت على مكانتها وتميزها بمثابرتها وبالجهد اللي يبذل. احنا متاكدين من ان عقولنا لا تقل اهميه وقدره على عقولنا بمعنى ان كثير من ابنائنا من الليبيين اللي يمشوا لتلك الجامعات يعني يتميزوا ويعني يثبتوا في جدارتهم وفي في في مكانتهم. طبعا مشكلة لان المخرجات بتاع الجامعات الان لم تعد بتلك تلك الصوره اللي كانت عليها الجامعات الليبيه في السابق. لكن على اي حال احنا لا نريد ان نفقد الامل وان متاكدين من ان احنا سنشكل رقم هذا العمل اللي ينجز الان هو عمل تراكمي احنا يعني لا نتوقع ان احنا الان من خلال البحوث اللي انجزت والنتائج اللي توصلنا اليها ستحقق لنا السبق في العالم وتحقق لنا دائرا ان احنا يعني حنوفر مقنع ولكنها جزء من يعني الدائره اللي تكلمت عنها في اداره المعرفه. احنا متجهين نحو انتاج المعرفه لان احنا يعني لدينا رغبه في ان احنا نضمن لانفسنا ولاولادنا ولمستقبل بلدنا وشعبنا وامتنا مكان في المستقبل يعني لا لا يمكن ان ان نستمر في هذا الوضع الهامش اللي احنا موجودين فيه. هذه فقط لتذكير وانا ممتن جدا للجهود اللي بذلت صحيح يعني كان ممكن يكون الوضع افضل من الان المفروض ان الجامعه كلها اليوم محتفيه بهذا اليوم العلمي كل اعضاء هيئه التدريس وكل الطلاب ومفروض ان احنا يعني هذه الجلسه تكون في نفس الوقت منقولة للقاعات اللي في الجامعة كلها ومنقولة حتى للعالم اللي برا لكل يعني الليبيين المفروض ذلك يتم وذلك سيتم سيأتي يوم حن يعني حنشهد هذا هذا المشهد أنا واثق من ذلك لكن لابد من النعم من من أجل الوصول إليه أنا أحييكم يعني حضوركم واهتمامكم وأحيي كل البحاث وكل الأساتذة اللي أشرفوا على هذا الجهد الكبير ولكن ليس هذا هو الطموح لابد أن تدركوا بأن طموحنا أكبر من ذلك ونحن نتوق إلى أن نكون فعلا قادرين على إحداث التغيير الذي يجب أن يكون حياكم الله كل عام وأنتم بخير شكرا جزيلا بارك الله فيكم الباحث ناجي مصطفى ناجي بوشعالة كلية الطب البشري Effective of COVID-19 on mental health Hello Thank you for coming today My name is Naji Mustafa Rusha'ala I am fifth year medical student at Libyan International Medical University Today we will discussing the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. We will be focusing on the following objectives. First, factors that contribute to mental illness in association with COVID-19. Outline the variety of various psychological presentations in association with COVID-19. Last, review the study that are linked to mental illness in association with COVID-19. As we see in the world, the COVID-19 virus is primarily known to affect the multiple systems, including the respiratory system, gastrointestinal system, 
cardiovascular and neurological system. However, as we uh, came to realize that the effect not limited to the physical uh, aspect of the human body, but it also affect the, one of the most crucial and most important part of the human body, which is the psychological or emotional system, especially in people who have a previous mental illnesses or substance abuser. The pandemic stands as a barrier in front of their way. However, we cannot put the blame toward the virus only. Um, because there is other factors such as the preventive measures and the laws placed by the government around the world uh, to limit the spread of the COVID cases also contribute to increase the cases of mental illnesses. In simple words, when we attempt to decrease the prevalence of COVID-19 cases, we have noticed increase in the cases of mental illnesses. There is inverse proportionality occur between the two. To further understand this relationship, we must shed the light on um, the multiple factors that contribute in, uh, to mental illness in association with COVID-19. The virus, which a part of the corona uh, family, isn't something new to the healthcare professionals and the physicians, but for the greater public is something new, recent and weird, and not heard about it before. So the situation with pandemic create unknown future. Um, that promote feeling of an anxiety, stress, uncomfortable for the people, and uh, certain questions boost to someone heads, like, um, will I get COVID-19 and this is my fate? Uh, am I going to lose my loved ones during pandemic? Uh, in addition to enforcing people to staying at home, staying in isolation, uh, undergoing quarantine, maintaining social distancing, uh, feeling lonely, as well as limitation of various entertainment activities uh, like coffee, jams, uh, and restaurant. Uh, in addition to deterioration of the economy of various countries, uh, and the world at large, uh, and increasing unemployment rate, uh, either temporary or permanent to the individuals. Uh, all of these factors that appeared uh, during pandemic, uh, uh, changing the life, uh, changing dramatically the life, so plays a lot of a challenge on the society to adapt with a new uh, lifestyle and uh, their, uh, to dealing with a huge amount of free time uh, that may predispose certain individual to uh, practicing unhealthy habits such as smoking, alcohol, alcoholism, uh, substance abuse, and overeating. In addition to the amplifications by the media and the news about outbreaks of COVID-19 and spreading of the misinformation and rumors on the social media lead public in confusion and terror, as well as the social stigma around the cases of COVID-19 um, that warrant the people to concealing the fact and not revealing to anyone. And here, we shouldn't exclude the healthcare providers and the uh, physicians who uh, on the first front line, who leave their families and loved ones behind and in order to combat the disease, um, in addition to carrying uh, incredible, incredible amount of responsibility and um, uh, tension, but by the society. All of these factors lead to psychological uh, presentations in association with this pandemic. Uh, the most important one is OCD, which is medical abbreviation of obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, is obsessive intrusive thoughts 
that cannot be controlled by the individual. For example, I greeted the person, this person may have COVID-19. I touching the surface, the surface is infected. I opening the door, the door is contaminated. Someone coughing next to me is carrying COVID-19. All of these thoughts making the person um, a greater state of negative emotions and anxiety and stress cannot be eliminated from these emotions uh, until the person forced to do compulsive action like uh, hand washing 15 times per hour or cleaning the surface all the time. All these, uh, after doing these actions, the person feels temporary relief from the anxiety. As soon as those thoughts return again and enter in the visual cycle to no end. The anxiety disorder, in simple words, is misusing of imagination and negative expectation of a future that translated to nervousness, irritability, um, practicing violence to the child, increasing in the uh, problems uh, inside the family, uh, and increasing in the cases of divorce during pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, the rate of multiple family members getting infection is high. Therefore, breed, uh, therefore the possibility of death uh, in more than one family member is also high. That's lead to um, uh, sadness and grave, uh, that's great and create a greater depression. Sleeping disturbance as well uh, can be uh, in form of nightmares or insomnia. Insomnia can be in two forms. First, they have difficulty to enter the cycle of sleep or can be as a fragmented intermittent sleep, so depriving the person from getting continuous, comfortable, sufficient sleep uh, to meeting the demand of the physical and psychological uh, body for the day. Okay, all of these disturbance and negative feelings forced the individual to searching about a way to relieving the psychological pain. Uh, maybe by addiction, takes drugs, smoking, or decide to escape or exit from the gate of the world for once and for all by committing suicide. This study shows the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted and stopped the critical mental health services in 93% of countries worldwide, while the demand for mental health is increasing. During the pandemic, about 4 in 10 adults in the United States have reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder. Difficulty sleeping in 36%. Increases in alcohol consumption or substance abuse only during pandemic, about 12%. Okay, throughout the pandemic, women have been more likely to report poor mental health compared to men. Men are more optimistic. For example, 47% of women reported symptoms of anxiety and or depressive disorder compared to 38% of men in December 2020. Most of them are adults, ranging from 18 to 24 years of old. Okay, my recommendations. The best thing in coronavirus is affect all people, doesn't differentiate between ethnicity, races, nationality, or religion. So please show your empathy, giving your support and care for people who are infected, and be kindness. Always remember your loved one that you are here for giving your support, and please learning to dealing and coping with the stress and um, a negative feeling by healthy way. At the last, if you're feeling the situations are out of the control, don't feel shame or hesitate to seek a help from the psychiatrist. And thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Rati, a doctor of the five years. And we're going to talk about the program in قبل ما نبدا حابه نشكر اول حاجه استاذ ناصر الكديكي مدير الخدمات الخدمات الصحيه استاذ رمضان الفيتوري المدير التنفيذي لحمله التطعيم ضد كوفيد واستاذ محمد الجروشي مدير العلاقات العامه على استقبالهم لنا في المدينه الرياضيه ومركز الخدمات الصحيه تمام الموضوع ان شاء الله مش طويل 
طبعا لما قابلناهم كان عندنا نحن كم أسئلة عن وضع الوبائي في بنغازي وعلى مركز المدينة الرياضية وعطونا بعض المعلومات عليهم وهذينا هنحكوا على الأسئلة والأجوبة والأجوبة بتاعتهم في السلايدات الجاية أول حرص أنها كانت على وضع الوبائي في بنغازي ما كانش في إحصائية دقيقة بعدد الحالات ما قدرش يوفروها لنا لكن على حسب الموقع بتاع مركز المركز الصحي المركز الوطني عدد الحالات كان خمسمية واحد ألف وسبعمية وثمانية وثلاثين بس هذه على مستوى ليبي يعني مش على بنغازي بس ما هو البرنامج الوطني لتطعيم كوفيد وما هي التوصيات أول أول مجال التطعيمات بدور في المنظومة وكان التسجيل فيها عن طريق كتابة الاسم والعمر واختيار أقرب عيادة مجمعة للشخص الأولوية كانت للفئة العمرية الأكبر سنا واللي عندهم أمراض مزمنة كانت تجيهم رسالة عشان تبلغهم أن تعالوا طعموا يعني التطعيمات أول حاجة كانت توصل للمركز الخدمات الصحية وبعدها يتم توزيعها على العيادات على حسب الأشخاص اللي سجلوا في المنظومة يعني مثلا 100 شخص سجلوا في عيادة الليثي و150 سجلوا في عيادة الفويهات حيوزعوا 100 تطعيم على عيادة الليثي و150 على عيادة الفويهات ما هي التطعيمات اللي تم استجلابها؟ وفروا خمس تطعيمات اللي هي الأسترازينيكا، السبوتنيك، الفايزر، السينوفارم والسينوفاك أول حاجة عطوا بس تطعيم السبوتنيك لعلمة كمان وبعدها عطوا الأسترازينيكا وهكذا ليش دور الحاجة هذه؟ كانت عشان خافوا من انتهاء صلاحية التطعيم وفساده وكذلك كان فيه الكنسبيرسيز بتاع اللي لا التطعيم الصيني في المايكرو تشيبس اللي تتراك ار افري موفمنت والحاجات هذينا يعني فعشان يمنعوا الخوف والحاجات هذه قعدوا يعطوا بالنوع تطعيم واحد تطعيم الفايزر لأنه كان يحتاج هذه تخزين بدرجة حرارة ناقص سبعين سلسيوس وهذه ما كانتش متوفرة هنا وكذلك نفس المشكلة كانت في تطعيم السبوتنيك لأنه كان يحتاج درجة حرارة ناقص ثمانتاش سلسيوس وهذه ما كانتش متوفرة لكن توا توفرني الحمد لله باقي التطعيمات ما كانش فيهن أي مشكلة لأنه كان يحتاج درجة حرارة ما بين اثنين وثمانية وهذه درجة حرارة أصلا متوفرة عندنا لأن نستخدم فيها في تطعيمات الأطفال باقي الصعوبات كانت لوجيستكس اللي عدد السيارات و... و... والعمال كم مركز صحي في بنغازي تم اختياره لإعطاء اللقاح؟ اختاروا 14 مركز من 32 ليش اختاروا 14 بس؟ كانت عشان ما يبوش يمنعوا التطعيمات بتاعت الأطفال ما يبوش يوقفوا عليها يعني بعدها قررت وزارة الصحة أنهم يوسعوا الشغل والجهود ويستخدموا المدينة الرياضية وتم تصميمها وتفعيلها وكذلك كان في فرق متحركة تمشي للسجون وذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة والأشخاص الكبار في السن في حواشينهم هل يوجد إقبال من المواطنين على أخذ التطعيمات؟ آه، يس إلى حد ما آه، بس كان واجد منهم من بشمول نقول الأغلبية لكن واجد منهم كان عشان عندهم أمراض معينة أو عشان يبوا يسافروا وحاجة تكي لكن باقي المجتمع كيف ما قلنا كان في يعني خوف أكثر حاجة من المضاعفات بتاعت التطعيم وكان في قلة وعي يعني هل العناصر الطبية والطبية المساعدة, المساعدة تم تحسينهم جميعا أو بالأحرى هل يوجد إقبال منهم على اللقاح؟ تم تطعيمهم المركز الوطني لمكافحة الأمراض أو أنهم يعطوا تطعيم السبوتنيك العناصر الطبية والطبية المساعدة مش عشان السبوتنيك أحسن حاجة بس لأنه كان أول تطعيم يتوفر يعني أنا بدأت حملة التطعيم أو حاجة للطقم الطبي في مراكز العزل وبعدها المستشفيات العامة الكبيرة والعيادات المجمعة عطوهم الجرعة الأولى وبعدها الجرعة الثانية ما هي الصعوبات التي واجهتكم في المنظومة واستقبال المواطنين؟ معظم الناس ما كانش عندهم رغبة أنهم يخشوا على النت ويسجلوا الجوازات يعني. بس هي ميزة المنظومة كانت أنها منظمة وما تدرج زحمة يعني في العيادات كيف ما شفنا نحن بعد ما وقفت المنظومة. بس هي دار المنظومة أصلا في البداية عشان ما كانش في التطعيم ما كانش واجد كانوا وفروا بمجموعة قليلة. فدار المنظومة هذه عشان يخلوا الأولوية لكبار السن واللي عندهم أمراض وبعدها لما وفروا كمية كبيرة خلوا الناس تجي تطعم براحتها يعني
نحكي عن المدينة الرياضية general information about it أول حاجة فتحوها في شهر ثمانية من سنة 2021 وفروا فيها تطعيم سيني سينوفار من الجرعة الأولى والثانية وبعدها وفروا سينوفاك أعمال الأشخاص اللي تم تطعيمهم كانت 18 فما فوق ما سجلوش أي حالات مضاعفات من التطعيم متوفرة فيها كافتيريا وغرف استراحة للأطباء والموردين عشان كان في الدكاترة يشتغلوا يعني من الساعة 9 الصبح ل 6 مساء كان فترة طويلة يعني متوسط عدد الأشخاص اللي يتم حضورهم من التطعيم يتعدى الألف شخص يوميا طبعا هذه كانت بداية فتح تمش توا مرحلة التطعيم في المركز أول حاجة أول ما يخش الشخص حيقيسوا له درجة الحرارة يشوفوها لو كانت عالية حيخشوا الشخص إلى غرفة خارجية يديروا له المسحة بتاع الكورونا لقوها بوزيتيف حيدوا له الحوش عشان تكورنتين لقوها نيجاتيف حيكمل معنا للمرحلة الثانية المرحلة الثانية يستقبلوها فيه الدكاترة عشان يسألوا لو عندها أي مشاكل صحية لو كانت مرأة لو هي كانت حامل حاجة تكي بعد حينتقل المرحلة الثالثة اللي هي حيستقبلوه الكشافة ويعطوه ورقة عليها الرقم بتاعه وعشان يراجي دورين في التطعيم المرحلة الرابعة اللي هو حيمشي للمكاتب الخاصة بالمنظومة في سبعة أشخاص مسؤولين عن منظومة في قسم الرجال وسبعة في قسم النساء يعطوهم الرقم والرقم الوطني وجواز السفر وبعد عشان يخشون في المنظومة ويعطوهم الورقة الخاصة بالتطعيم المرحلة الخامسة يخشون من حجر التطعيم في عشر حجر في قسم النساء وعشرة في قسم الرجال يطعموا بعدين آخر حاجة يعطوهم هذه يخدمونهم على الورقة بتاع التطعيم ويخرجوا كم عدد المواطنين اللي تم تحسينهم؟ العدد طبعا على ليبيا بالكامل اللي عندي يوم واحد وثلاثين ثلاثة كان فوق الاثنين مليون كجرعة أولى وجرعة ثانية فوق الواحد مليون هل تم تسجيل حالات مضاعفات خطيرة بعد التطعيم؟ ما سجلوش أي حالات مضاعفات بس كان في حالات الإغماء فوبيا فوبيا الدم أو الإبرة هل تم تطعيم الحوام في البرنامج؟ لا وشكرا لحسن استماعكم. لا أولا أسعد الله صباحكم جميعا ويوفقكم كل عام وأنتم بخير. شكرا جزيلا على المجهودات المبذولة. فخورين جدا بمستوى الحافل للطلاب ما زالوا لم يتخرجوا بعد. سؤالي للطالبة هي رياضة ذكرت بأن الحوامل يتم سبعين. هل في قاعدة علمية فعلية تقول بأن حوامل اللي ما عملش كل التطعيمات وتطعيمات معينة شكرا هي لا ما فيش قاعدة معينة يعني حتى على حسب الدراسات ما كانش في واحد من التطعيمات انه يقولوا لا هذا الحوامل ممنوع او حاجة هيك لكن هذه كانت بس من توصيات اللي في ليبيا يعني بس سؤالي دكتور ناجي أنا حبيت نسمع أنت توقعت تأثير الإمباكت أوف سايكولوجيكال إمباكت أوف كوفيد 19 أون ديفرنت أعمار مختلفة الشباب الأطفال على الواسطين هل في اختلاف في السايكولوجيكال إمباكت عليه وبرضه الإمبلومنت على المال الموظفين كبار بالنسبة للإجابة على السؤال نعم طبعا الدراسات في ليبيا بالنسبة للتأثير كان قل يعني ما حصلتش دراسات هنا ولكن بالنسبة للعالم كلهم في دراساتهم أوضح أنه في فرق كبير بين مختلف الأعمار وتأثير الصحة الصحة النفسية عليه بالنسبة للدراسة اللي أنا جبتها اللي هو الجو إن 56% من الناس كان أعمار ما بين 18 وال 24 عكس ما كانوا متوقعين أنهم يقولوا كبار في العمر أكثر من 65 بالعكس كانت نسبتهم قليلة جدا لأنهم هم أغلبهم أصلا كانوا أوردي برا في أمريكا يعانوا من الوحدة لكن بالنسبة للشباب كانوا عندهم نشاطات في حياتهم دهورا فجأة بين يوم وليلة فبالتالي تأثروا هم أكثر ناس وأكثر فئة كانت ما بين 18 إلى 24 إصابة بالأمراض النفسية والاكتئاب والقلق والإدمان أما بالنسبة للأعمال طبعا في فرق جدا واضح 
بالنسبه للناس اللي يعتمدوا على قوت اليوم انهم يخرجوا من المنزل هم اكثر تاثرا عكس الناس اللي كان استخدامهم للاونلاين والمتاجر الالكترونيه بالعكس في ناس حققت مكاسب اكثر اثناء كورونا والفرصه جت معهم لكن اغلب الناس اللي تعرضوا للفقدان الوظائف هم الناس اللي كانوا محتاجين زي مثلا سائقين التكاسي وغيره من العاملين البناء والحاجات هذين هم اكثر ناس تاثروا وكان في فرق اه هي الدراسة في ان من الاعمال اللي اكثر ومن الاعمال اقل بس الدراسات اللي لقيتها كلهم برا ليبيا صراحه مش فيش دراسه جوا ليبيا شكرا آه. تواجه طبيب الاسنان في المهنه. المشكله حتى لما تكون متخرج وتفكر في حاجات معينه باهي ايفن افتر جراديويتنج يور ثينكينج اباوت يور جوينج تو ورك ذيس ورك از غونا برينج بروفيت يور جوينج اون ذا توب اوف ذا وورلد بات ذا ثينك از وين يو جيت اون ذا توب اوف ذا وورلد يو غوتا بي كام اتس اول اباوت ذات وان برونغ بوستشر ذات وان مايكروب ذات لوتس ان ذا اير ذات ماي ديستروي يور كارير فور ايفر ذات ليد اس تو اور توبيك توداي اتس اوكيبيشنال هيلث بروبلمز among dentists, especially in Libya. The things we'll be including today is, we're gonna have some brief introduction about the problems. What is the occupational health risk, their definition, and the need for the awareness, the methodology about the study that I conducted, the results of these studies, some discussion regarding the topic of musculoskeletal disorders, which is the main problem regarding the occupational health risks, the stress, and the precutaneous injuries, and the other. First, we can identify what is the occupational health problems. Occupational health problems, it's what may doom the dental practitioners for the time coming. It's all about the, the improper posture, the inadequate cross-infection control, followed with bad management, stress, cutaneous injuries, are to affect the delivery of proper and efficient dental work. Here, I enumerate some of the problems. The physical hazards, including radiation, that we may encounter and we are encounter every day in the dental practice. The chemical hazards, the, the material we use in the dentistry carry some danger and some allergic effect on us. The ergonomic hazard, the ergonomic hazard or the musculoskeletal problems are the leading cause of dentists in declining their work. The biological hazards, mainly bacterial, virus and fungal infections. Occupational health risk, as a definition, is an occupational disease, a disease or a health dilemma caused by the work or the working environment. The WHO have another definition for it. First, it talks about the health and safety in the workplace, and it's how it gets endangered during this period of time. The study conducted was done in a systemic literature review, including studies from the year 2006 to 2018, using the search engines, PubMed, and Google. The de included dentist, dental hygienist, and dental therapist. The targeted dentists were at least between six to nine years in the dental practice, from the age of 25 to 60, either government governmentally aided clinics or private dental practice, male and female, of course. The predominant type of study that included was uh, questionnaire, which is the easiest type to collect, and included seven countries. These countries are, in a, in a, of course, in a correlation to Libya. Libya, Croatia, Lithuania, the United Arab Emirates, Lebanon, East Jerusalem, and Sheikh Republic. At first, there was many and many numbers of studies. They had to go through two or three processes. First, the identification. There was 38 studies identified. Then, the eligibility decreased them until 20. Then finally, there was seven studies included. The results that presented and will be presented in a summarized table, including the most cross-sectional studies, 
in this type of studies in a questionnaire, which mostly related to musculoskeletal disorders in these seven countries, as I will elaborate. First, we're going to start with the United Arab of Emirates. There, the included number of dentists was 733 dentists in a questionnaire type of studies. As you can see, 86 per, uh, 68 percent of them had musculoskeletal disorders, 48 precutaneous injuries, 80 percent suffered from an allergic type of disease called contact dermatitis, and 5 percent have hearing problems regarding to the dental instrument that we use that may cause loud noises to our ear. In Libya, the study was mainly done in Tripoli. The dentists were 340 dentists, 48 musculoskeletal disorders, there was 35% of precutaneous injuries and 22% eye injury related to either needle, some splatter of uh, vit uh, some vital objects or burrs or, or that we use in dental clinic. As you can see, the musculoskeletal and precutaneous are the most common. In Croatia, 506 dentists. Usually it was done in an online questionnaire. As you can see, 92% 92, 92 of them acknowledge the dentistry is a harmful practice. That's a large number to a dentist to acknowledge that their job caused them a problem. 33.9% suffer from musculoskeletal problems. 24.6% suffer from stress. Stress didn't emerge in the last two studies, but it's starting to emerge in these studies. As long as the community, even if the community evolved forward, the stress is supposed to decrease, yet it increases with the development of the industry. 18.1% industry. have infections, 7.7% noises, and other related to allergy to dental, dental materials. In Lithuania, 949 dentists. There was specified problems here regarding the musculoskeletal problems. 94.7% suffer from fatigue, 91% suffer from back pain, 2.1% from angina pectoris, which is a really serious problem when you think about it. 26% suffer from joint disease and 22.6% suffer from allergy. Um, in Lebanese dentists, 340 dentists, here also we specify specific areas of the body. 61.5% related to spinal pain, 31.6% related to cervical pain, 22.3% lumbar pain, and 13% suffer from dorsal pain. In East Jerusalem, 40 dentists. It was uh, discussed that the knowledge of the infectious disease, which was 95%, musculoskeletal and stress. Stress related to the area of the study. Finally, the Czech Republic. 581 dentists, 33.7% of them suffer from musculoskeletal disorders. As you can see here, the high percentage of 77.8% suffer from needed psychological demands, which also relates to stress and other bad management. The widespread of occupational health hazard is a dilemma among dental practitioners, with musculoskeletal disorder, precutaneous injuries, and stress are the most relevant, although the development of a new innovative equipment, numerous studies show that the occupational health risk are on the rise. The results is different, in different countries showed mostly the musculoskeletal disorders, then followed by other disorders, shoulder pain, neck, hand, arm, wrist, and lower back pain. Improper ergonomics has imposed the strain among dental practitioners. The musculoskeletal problems. Many dentists suffer from a syndrome which is called Car carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is, is, a, is an injury to the median nerve which is caused by improper posture during, den during dental treatment, which is a, a huge dilemma to the dentist. Some dentists even decline dentistry after this injury. Stress. The stress is a common thread among dentists. A system to manage it is in, in the need. A practical and a financial management is one of the main causes of stress. A majority of dentists in the UAE of 78% complain of a burnout. There's something called burnout syndrome, which has caused, which has done many numbers to the dentist. You cannot come to a clinical judgment. You cannot comprehend the cases you have. You get nothing. Uh, burnout. A number of them presented with chronic symptoms that may affect their clinical judgment. 
In Lebanon, they complained of stresses caused by illegal and insurance exhaustion, which is, is a double-edged blade. The illegal problems always impose problems in dentistry, even in other white-collar problems. Uh, FYI, dentistry have the highest number of suicide among the white-collar communities. Precutaneous injury. Precutaneous injury, the proportion of dentists in the UAE of 42% reporting at least one precutaneous injury, like we call it the needle stick injury. Of surgical devices, 46.2% in needles, 25.6% and scalpels, 16%. Some are attributed to bite. Importance of educational program for uprising dentists and a vigilant supervision of interns, especially. Allergy, mainly due to larynx. 38% in Libyan dentists, presented as pruritus, articaria, eczema, and asthma. Almost, quarter has ex almost a quarter has experienced contact dermatitis of dentists in Libya, which dentistry regarded as a wet work with dentists and dental students, intensive users of gloves and skin barriers, with the all of introduction of the desensitization of product, which would compete due to the lalex allergy infection in the UAE. 74.6% of dentists are protected by vaccination against hepatitis B, which is in the Libyan dental student usually gets vaccinated before the clinical phase of education, which permits the dentist and uprising student safe practice, which is one of the most important topics we do in here. In conclusion, the literature review demonstrates the occupational health problems, which shows its harmful effect on the dentist, on the dental practitioner. Multiple and current research studies demonstrate an uprising and an occupational health risk are at the rise. We cannot protect ourselves until we educate ourselves. Education is the most important thing, either for the dentist or for the dental students. Any references? Thank you. لما نداروا الكوشنير هذه كانوا متواجدين في طرابلس واغلب الناس اللي استجابوا للكوشنير هذه كانوا من سكان طرابلس فهم لما داروها كبروها على دكاتره الاسنان المتواجدين في طرابلس اما الفكره او شنو الحاجه اللي نخبوها من الدراسه هذه نخبوها ان المشاكل الجسديه اللي واجهنا كطبيب اسنان هي واجد متنوعه ومشكلتنا كطبيب اسنان ان الحاجات هذه نتعلم فيها ونتنقلوا فيها في الجامعه سواء في جامعتنا هنا او في اي مكان اخر في العالم هذنا يعتبرون اساسيات منها فمشكله ان احنا نبدو مستعجلين الشغل ونخشوا اكثر عدد من المرضى ونبدو نشتغلوا اكثر حاجه في اليوم هذه الحاجه كلها تضرنا وتخلينا بدل ما نكملوا الناس هذه الى مثلا 30 40 سنه قدام بقى يخلينا ممكن حتى 10 سنين نوظفوا وهذه الحاجه اللي بدنا نخشوا. <تصفيق> كمان يجوني حتى العرض بتاعها مستوى عبد المالك في الفشاني وجنان نزيل اللي موجود منه ما انت بيعرض مجموعة ولا واحد واحد أنت ثلاثة كما عبد المالك وجنان مصار الشجاء الفحص بتاعها بعنوان في الواجب في الله أنا عمي تعرف من تعرف من تعرف من تعرف والبحث هذا جروب مشروع تخرج بتاعها بس اشراف الدكتورة Uh, good morning, doctors and colleagues. Welcome to our presentation. We'll talk about clinical pathological parameter in thyroid carcinoma. Supervisor Dr. Hanan Jaralla, me, Sarah Abdurrahman, my colleague Jilal Nazih Abdel Malik Al Hashani. Objective of this presentation introduction is background about disease. Uh, Methodology describe the strategy about the paper result and discussion the outcome of a study. Final limitation and conclusion. Okay. Cancer genetic related disease characterized by abnormal cell or change cell, division, invasion, and metastasis of cancer cell from primary side to other side in the body. Thyroid cancer is a rare type of cancer and the most common malignant disease in endocrine system and is, increased, uh, and, uh, is rapidly increased in incidence. Also, most primary thyroid cancer epithelium tumor that originate from thyroid follicular cell. It was clear that as carcinoma arising from epithelium tissue progressed higher uh, pathological grades of malignancy. 
Also, most primary, also more primary uh, than five types have been classified under thyroid cancer. Interestingly, each type of thyroid cancer possesses distinct feature characteristics. The histopathological pattern of thyroid carcinoma. Babylonian thyroid carcinoma is the most common type of thyroid cancer, followed by follicular thyroid carcinoma and anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. It's aggressive and rapid metastasis. Medullary thyroid carcinoma arises from thyroid parafollicular. The aims of the study was to determine the clinical and pathological characteristics in different surgical subtypes of, thy of thyroid cancer. In this methodology, patient the medical record uh, of 184 cases of thyroid cancer obtained between 2003 to 2020 from the Oncology Hospital and BMC Hospital, as well as the Arab Medical University and Pathological Department. Retrospective study using the clinical data and histological diagnosis we are retrieved from the hospital medical archive and pathological reports. Now continue my colleague Abdel Malik. Now start with the result. We we made like we measure different parameters in this uh, paper or research. We start with uh, gender. As we see in this pie chart, we find that the the gender was dominated was a female gender, with a different uh, with a sex uh, with a 76.1 percent comparing to the male with a 23.9 percent. The ratio was female to male ratio was seven to two. Uh, we may we made another parameters as the age distribution. We find that seriously we don't find any significant different. Uh, the data show that there is no significant difference. We find that the people older than 40 was uh, 51 percent, and people younger than 40 was uh, 49 percent. Now this table show that the, the frequency of different uh, pathological uh, histopathological patterns. We find that the, the high frequency was in papillary carcinoma with 48.4%, uh, followed by follicular variants of papillary carcinoma with 29.3%. Uh, the, the third one was in plastic carcinoma with 17.4%, and the last one was uh, less frequency was follicular carcinoma with 4.9%. Uh, now, we made a correlation between main age and the different histopathological patterns. We, found, uh, we find that uh, our data show that the high main age was found in uh, follicular variants of papillary carcinoma with uh, 77.9 years, the followed by anaplastic carcinoma with 43.9 years. The third was in uh, with, uh, thyroid carcinoma with uh, follicular variants with the 37.57. The less or uh, the lower main age was found in the papillary carcinoma with the predominant of uh, female gender. Now we made parameters uh, determine the aggressiveness of uh, disease. The first one was, uh, 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 was a state a grade. We find all the most cases was great, uh, diagnosed or was in grade two with a 45% followed it by grade three with a 38%, and the less common one was uh, grade one with a 17%. The second uh, parameters was uh, stage. We find uh, most cases diagnostic or end stage uh, four with a 38%, and uh, followed by stage three, malignancy uh, three uh, with a 29%, and the less common was stage one and two with a 14% for stage one and 19% uh, for stage two. Now with my colleague Jilan, we'll continue with you. Okay, now with the, the outcome of project in discussion. So the incidence and histopathological pattern of thyroid cancer or thyroid disease show the geographical and regional variation related to the age, sex, dietary, and environmental factor. In this study, show the most common uh, patient in 40s old age, and as we mentioned in the results section, mean age of patient at the presentation was 14.5 years old. And the similar results have been found in Salomon 2015. There were 76.1% female cases and 23.9% male cases in our study with a female to male ratio 7 to 2. Similar results have been found in the study conducted by Gopta 2013. 
So the thyroid cancer have many different type, but the most common type is papillary carcinoma, uh, with female predominance as seen in a previous study of Fong and Gem, followed by follicular variants of papillary carcinoma, anaplastic carcinoma, and follicular carcinoma, which is approximately resemble of other study, Kavala Hero 2016. So regarding to the grade, the most common grade is grade two which comparable with other study carried out by Erin Galuria 2018. And the show uh, or results show the percentage of patients present in stage 3 and stage 4, more than in percent, percentage of patients in stage 1 and stage 2, which lead to an increased rate of recurrence and, in, and decreased rates of survival. In conclusion, the age of study at cases ranged between 14 to, 80 to 95 years old. The mean age of patient with thyroid malignancy was 14.5 years old. The percentage of patient more than or equal 40 years old was 51%. Will patient less than or equal 40 years old formed 49%. Babillary carcinoma is the most common thyroid cancer followed by follicular, medullary, anaplastic and lymphoma. Thyroid cancer is reported to be female predominance. And the last one, association parameter of aggressiveness with alpha variable behavior, suggesting the role of histopathological diagnosis, grading, and staging of thyroid cancer. The limitation. Uh, the recording data in some patient was not completed, and the data in 2017 was missed in Benghazi Medical Center, and we need to build resources through the high quality center to collecting data before and after surgery, to covering the state of a primary tumor and post-operative recurrence, metastasis, and survival. And the future work you need using immunohistochemical diagnostic and a prognostic marker is need for more accurate of diagnosis uh, of patient or thyroid cancer patient. Acknowledgement. We thank Dr. Hanan Jarallah for his guidance and support uh, and uh, th uh, thank my faculty, Faculty of Pharmacy in Libyan International Medical University and Oncology Hospital and Benghazi Medical Hospital as well as Department of Pathology at Benghazi University. And finally, we surprised me and my colleague, Sarah and Abdel Malik, because our project is uh, published in uh, journals, uh, International Journal of Science and Research in November 2021. And I get a total score 85%. And thank you for your attention. Thank you أتمنى أن يكون البوستر يعني ينعرض يكون أوضح شوية من بدري عموما الطلاب اللي مشاركين أيضا كلهم قاعدين بقدموا عندي محمد السويدي ريتاج العبيدي نهى الكماطي من يمني هيقدم ريتاج ونهى ريتاج ونهى تمام متحمسين واجد طبعا السيدة عنوان البحث بتاعهم Determination and Exploration of the Quality of Life and Treatment Satisfaction in Patients with Type 1 Diabetes Using Subcutaneous Insulin Daily Information Okay, good afternoon, uh, Supervisor Hana Habib uh, Mary Taj Labaydi with my colleague Noha Nagmati will present our poster which is about the quality of life and treatment satisfaction an adult patient with diabetes type 1 treated with a multiple daily injection in Magazi Libi. So first, simple introduction. Introduction diabetes is a, is, is a major healthy problem because it is highly prevents morbidity and mortality, uh, effects on the quality of life and can be causes emotional and physical overload. So needed for lifelong treatment, so the like, quality of life measures uh, both healthy and well-being related to the disease and the treatment is measured depend on the patient experience and the result of treatment. So what is the aim of the study? The aim of the study is the, to show the quality of life and treatment satisfaction in adult patient with diabetes type 1 either treated with a continuous subcontinuous insulin infusion or multiple daily injection. So the methodology, this is study uh, in Libya, it was 2020, 2021, 
and that is in diabetic hospital. The hospital gave a letter explaining the purpose of, the, of this study and to show the confidently of this study. So when they take a request, we ask the patients, variable request to be participate in this study. So this study includes inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the inclusion criteria is male and female with diabetes type 1, the age between 80 to 55, attended diabetic clinical for routine vest. And the exclusion criteria, we exclude the age before the 18 and after the 56. And non-Libyan nationalities. So the results, 50% 50 50 of patients can in age 46 to 55, 53.3 of patients was male, and 40% with, with the levels, education levels, uh, graduate. So uh, we use a three questionnaire to prepare our questionnaire, which is diabetic specific quality of life, diabetic treatment satisfaction questionnaire, and sorry, and and 36 atom short form healthy survey. So some questions contained in our questionnaire, for example, the gender and correlation between the genders and treatment satisfactions. The most percent was in male with the 81.3 percent. And another question is uh, correlation between the age and treatment satisfaction. The highly percent candidate in Egypt always. Uh, with an age 36 to 46, and uh, highly percent can 85.7. Another question can in, uh, for in the last past four weeks, uh, how physical act, physical health and emotional problem affect on the normal social uh, activity. The highly percent uh, in age 26 to 35, uh, an answer can vary often with a 60%. Okay, now we'll continue with my colleague Noah Abmat. So now I will talk about the discussion part of this study. Uh, the sample had taken from the three diabetic clinics from the Benghazi, enrolled 90 patients, showing that, firstly, uh, the number of studies had the same results with a close percentage. One of them, repo uh, them reported in a study in Italy, where the 54.7. Uh, 0.3% males and 45.7 females. Uh, uh, the, uh, this indicates that medications are available uh, in the pharmacies and hospitals in the Benghazi. After that, uh, after that, that when asked patients, do you, do, do you find difficult or easy to find treatment? Uh, the vast majority of patients feel comfortable to find the treatment in 90% and compared to only 10% not feel comfortable. And when I ask, uh, as well as patient satisfaction presented in high percentage between males graduate and aged between 26 to 35, may the reason due to the, uh, due to the uh, education level at other stage uh, had a direct effect on the quality of the life. Whereas the answer of patients regarding their nutrition and psychological state uh, was a close uh, that's uh, uh, related to the different unstable community situation and uh, COVID-19 impact at the same time. After that, the limitations of this study, uh, the first or large medication uh, limitation is a COVID-19 pandemic that affect on data collection process. Uh, after that, uh, inability to communicate with patients using cutaneous, subcutaneous insulin infusion in, Lib in Libya. And uh, some hospitals refuse to allow to take information from the patient. And last limit is the recall bias uh, affected on the self-reported uh, self quality of the life. As a conclusion, diabetes type 1 is the most co uh, common condition. It's considered as an important public health concern that significantly increase the risk of health problems. And health related quality of the life, uh, considered as a multi-dimensional concept, include domains related to effect of both physical and mental health, health perception. And they're correlated such as health risk and uh, conditions. And uh, uh, this is the references, and thank you for attention. <laughs> البحث الأخير عندنا طبعا هذا مقدم لأحسن بحث في الكلية من أول هي التدريس الدكتور علي المقصود للأسف يعني ظروفه ما سمحتش بالتواجد اليوم والظروف الصحية وحكيت مع الدكتورة حنين المصري و...
هو ايضا بحث نشر السنه هذه عن ديستيبيديميا ان فيتامين دي ستيتس ان ديابيتيك بيشنتس بنشوف في مجله يعني جيده يعني احنا اختير طبقا للمعايير اللي وضعها المركز واللجنه كافضل بحث بليستيبيديا We present our work, it's lipidemia and vitamin D status in uh, diabetes, uh, diabetic patients. Uh, the paper was published in the uh, in International Journal of Current Science um, Research and Review in 2022. Introduction, this lipidemia is one of the most common uh, metabolic syndrome among uh, diabetic patients uh, due to several factors, um, including insul insulin insufficiency, uh, resistance, and central obesity. Uh, furthermore, both vitamin D deficiency and diabetes um, are most public health worldwide problem. Recently, vitamin D deficiency is considered uh, one of the most characteristic topics, uh, and it's common and relevant affected uh, all ages, genders, uh, races, uh, uh, geographical regions, and uh, in addition to uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, deficiency of vitamin D uh, can contribute to many um, conditions, uh, include among uh, which uh, is uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, vitamin D uh, receptors and inactive form of vitamin D uh, is essential uh, for the synthesis of uh, the active form of uh, uh, 1,222-dishydroxyl uh, vitamin D. Uh, recently, uh, is, uh, it has been uh, provided that vitamin D deficiency and uh, insufficiency are associated with many chronic diseases, including cancer, uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, metabolic syndromes, uh, infections, and uh, immuno, um, immunological diseases. Aim of our studies is to study the dyslipidemia and vitamin D status in diabetic patients, uh, in addition to study the relation between vitamin D status and, vitamin, uh, and lipid profile in diabetic patients. Methods, uh, study design, and sample size. Uh, a cross-sectional study was conducted uh, and randomly selected uh, diabetic patients from diabetic centers, uh, center from beginning of November 2020 uh, through the end of April uh, 2021. Uh, the target groups, uh, those diabetic patients, either have uh, vitamin D uh, deficiency and <coughs> stibilipidemia. Second group, uh, second group, vitamin D uh, dis, um, deficiency with uh, no dyslipidemias, and the third one, dyslipidemia with no vitamin D deficiency. Uh, the total the number of patients selected randomly were uh, 165, um, by which 110 women and uh, 55 men. The average age, age of patients were uh, uh, 45 years old, with a minimum age 18, um, 18 um, uh, years old and maximum age uh, 70 years old. Uh, furthermore, the study includes both types of diabetes uh, mellitus, but unfortunately, sample type of type 1 diabetes mellitus was very small. Uh, the vision of this study uh, characterized and um, uh, selected and divided to three groups. Uh, 61 uh, diabetic patients have vitamin D deficiency and this uh, lipidemia gave group one. Uh, 33, um, 33 diabetic, uh, diabetic patients have vitamin D deficiency and no dyslipidemia gave to uh, second group. And the third one, 71 um, uh, diabetic patients with, uh, have dyslipidemia and no vitamin D deficiency. The patients in this study were either on vitamin D uh, supplement nor on lipid lowering agents and selected based on age gender uh, matching and no treatment has been initiated. Uh, the patients were also followed and conducted to provide la uh, last values um, obtained for lipid profile, vitamin D status, uh, FBS and HbA1c at the end of the study. Uh, biomedical investigation, uh, serum lipid profiling, uh, vitamin D uh, levels, and fasting blood glucose, uh, HB1AC uh, status have been uh, measured at the beginning and the end of the study. Therefore, the mean uh, plus minus standard deviation were calculated and presented in the second table as overall mean. Questionnaire, uh, pre-designed questionnaire were uh, validated and contain number of questions with four sections with 20 questions related to personal information, uh, demographic data, type of diabetes, and uh, biomedical investigation including vitamin D and liver, uh, lipid profile. Uh, ethical consideration, uh, the uh, ethical approval uh, letter was conducted uh, from uh, Libya International uh, Medical University Board for uh, ethical uh, approval. Uh, informed consent uh, was, was obtained and signed by the patient uh, while they are filling the questionnaire. 
Results, uh, the first figure uh, was age distribution of uh, patients. The majority of our patient was uh, among the um, 85, um, uh, 80, uh, sorry, 58 percent uh, was from 41 uh, to 60 years, followed by uh, the uh, above uh, 61 years, the home kind of 34 percent. Uh, gender distribution of the patients, uh, the majority of them was uh, female with uh, a percentage 66.6 uh, 6 percent. A type of diabetes, all of them, all, a majority of them was from type 2, uh, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus with a 96.9 percent. Table 1, patient char uh, characterization and groups. The first group was diabet uh, diabetic patients have vitamin D deficiency and dyslipidemia. Uh, there were uh, 61 uh, patients with a percentage 37%. Uh, the second one, diabetes patients uh, have vitamin D deficiency and no dyslipidemia with uh, 20%. And the last one, diabetic patients have dyslipidemia and no vitamin D deficiency with majority here, uh, 43% with total patient 165. Serum parameters and patient characterization, medical tests will, uh, will laboratory tests, here can add vitamin D uh, among different uh, groups, El cholesterol, will um, HDL, LDL, will VLDL, will F F FBG, we have information about them. The gender distribution among the patients who are men and women can the profile of cholesterol and lipid profiles can increase in the majority of the women can increasing than the men. The discussion, as we said, dyslipidemia is the most common metabolic syndrome among the diabetic patients due to the insulin insufficient. Vitamin T has been shown played an important role in diabetes mellitus development. And, uh, Lee indicates in uh, dyslipidemia uh, the, the, uh, the present studies uh, relevant that vitamin D deficiency and dyslipidemia are most common among uh, Lee diabetic patients uh, and uh, was also estimated in a uh, number of studies, previous studies. In present work, uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, indicates either Lee elevated serum cholesterol, TG, uh, very low density lipoprotein, LDL in both diabetic patients with vitamin D deficiency. And the dyslipidemia or uh, diabetic patients have vitamin D deficiency and no dyslipidemia. Uh, a study conducted by Young, uh, etc., all found that vitamin D uh, was uh, negatively correlated with the fasting uh, blood glucose with TG and TC. Uh, furthermore, the previous studies uh, showing a close correlation between uh, here vitamin D levels and uh, glycoprotein, uh, glycolipid uh, metabolism, in which the most observed study confirmed that vitamin D was neg uh, negatively correlated with the uh, FBG, LTG, TC, LD, LC, and these studies was um, consistent with the present work. Uh, however, the present work um, uh, lowered serum level HDL uh, was associated with vitamin D deficiency even in diabetic patients with vitamin D deficiency and no dyslipidemia, and this result was that, and this agreed with the previous work um, of uh, Jean Thiel and Lewil, uh, in which in their findings showed that vitamin D uh, deficiency has positive association with uh, HDL levels. Uh, on the other hand, study carried out uh, by uh, Sternal, um, etc. all showed that serum vitamin D level was associated with uh, 0.015 a uh, millimolar uh, decrease in HDL uh, for um, FBG and HbA1c similar results has been found in previous works. Furthermore, vitamin D deficiency was associated with dyslipidemia even in patients uh, who didn't uh, have uh, dyslipidemia. Similar have been con uh, confirmed in study conducted in China, uh, Saudi Arabia and India, but the previous study indicated that HDL uh, positively correlated with the HDL uh, cholesterol level and this finding were uh, disagree with the present result in which uh, deficiency uh, lead to slight increase in serum HDL. Uh, regarding gender distribution, vitamin D uh, deficiency and dyslipidemia, the current work given that um, females gender have more uh, complicated uh, dyslipidemia and higher level of uh, fasting blood glucose um, and FB1AC than male, uh, in which study con uh, conducted in Saudi Arabia found that women with the vitamin D deficiency has higher level 
of TG than men, and men has higher HDL than women of, uh, and this finding uh, was on uh, non-diabetic patients. Uh, according to our knowledge, no further, uh, no further studies uh, have been found. The finding of this work uh, could explain in part due to uh, in, uh, adipose in the women, uh, in which uh, the lifestyle and increased body fat might lead to more insulin resistance, with uh, which uh, um, eventually um, implicated in high level of lipid profile, FBG and HbA1c. Overall, dyslipidemia was common among diabetic uh, patients, especially type 2 diabetes mellitus, and vitamin D deficiency indicated here uh, dyslipidemia and elevated level of uh, FBG and HB1AC. Uh, furthermore, women found more su uh, sufferers from higher level of lipid profiles, um, FBG and H1, HBA1C than men. In conclusion, the present study revealed that vitamin D deficiency associated negatively with the serum level, TC, TG, uh, very low density lipoprotein, LD, LFBG, and HP1AC, uh, whereas uh, the uh, deficiency of vitamin D linked to elevated HDL levels. In uh, gender distribution, lower uh, vitamin D values associated with elevated serum FBG, uh, HB1AC lipid profile with the expansion HDL in women. Uh, the data of this study uh, suggests that uh, diabetic patients with uh, dyslipidemia may improve the, their lipid profile and really cause the uh, hemostasis through vitamin D supplement. This is our references. Thank you for listening. So welcome doctors, my name is Rana Hasid Shimbish. So today, today I'm going to present our lab report which is talking about relation between, a relationship between the obesity and pulmonary function tests. So first of all, the obesity which have been defined by World Health Organization as abnormal condition as a result of fat distributed along the diaphragm and a fail of redistribution of these fats. So the body mass, uh, the body mass index is used, is used to indicate the obesity by using the person height and weight. And also we have the person is considered to be obese if their BMI is, is, is going to be higher or more than 30 kilogram per um, square meter. So the first diaphragm shows the fashion of the obesity have been increased from the 2000 to 2018. And the second picture so shows the obesity and it's related with other uh, function disease or other lung disease and cardiovascular disease. So such as we have the most common uh, lung function disease associated with the obesity is obstructive sleep apnea and also uh, uh, obesity hypoventilatory mechanism. So a lot of study recommend the possible pathway for the hypoventilation accompanied with the obesity, it might be unclear or it might be due to the fat distributed in the respiratory muscles. So the aim of this study to correlate or to assess a relationship between the obesity and the spirometer parameters. So in this study we could have 50 middle aged group uh, participate male and females. We conduct 48 of males and 52 females with the middle aged. Uh, we, we excluded here the lung uh, patients who already have a chronic illness or lung uh, disease. And we included, unfortunately, the smoker. The BMI was used to indicate the opacity and the spirometer, uh, spirometer tests such as the force of vital capacity, force of expiratory volume, and the ratio between them to conduct the function uh, the lung function tests. According to, to our result, we designed the three tables. So the first table shows the demographic features of our participants. So there is BMI was 30 13, and their height and weight was 164, and their weight was uh, 90. The smoker state where uh, fifth, uh, four of them were smoker in this case, and the other were non-smoker. So the second table shows the correlation between the females and male according to their BMI and also according to the spirometer <coughs> parameters. So all of these um, correlations shows there's no significant relationship between of them and there's no significant decrease or increase. Uh, 
for 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 the for the last table shows the relationship between the PMI itself and the parameters. So the first the first one shows the PMI and force of vital capacity, which is strong negative correlation, and the second one shows between the PMI and force expiratory volume one, which shows a neg weak negative correlation, and the last one between the PMI and the ratio, and which it, it wasn't significant significant correlation. So the possible pathway that have been accompanied by a lot of studies, so the possible pathway for the hyperventilatory mechanism and reduce the force vital capacity as, as a result of a refrain of free distribution in the diaphragm and also in muscles uh, of respiratory, which lead to mechanical compression of these, uh, of these mus um, and fat on these muscles and decrease the ventilatory mechanism. So the second thing that has been explained by many studies is the forced expiratory volume. Forced expiratory volume has been also decreased in many studies and has been in, uh, increased in a lot of studies. So there is a recommend because the uh, PCC is restricted pulmonary disease and a lot of the restricted pulmonary disease associated with decrease the forced vital capacity and also the forced expiratory volume. Unfortunately, we involve here the smoker. A smoker in one of the restricted pulmonary also disease is considered to be disturbed the blood flow, uh, sorry, disturbed the airflow and airway resistant, cause airway resistant. So, however, in this study, we consistently want to correlate between the BMI and focus more by the force of vital capacity, but there is uh, there is many different. Um, limitation here considered like a smoker and also the gender. Um, so we can conclude in this study that the PMI and force of vital capacity have a strong negative correlation that we considered with the previous study but not in our study. Uh, because we have a different limited, uh, we have a different limitation according to disturbance of a fat and also the gender and the last one is the smoker. So this is our referencing, and thank you. Shukran Rana, but I have to say that the poster is a presentation, the result from a lab report that the student conducted during the last year. Can I have another poster, another lab report, and another one from another one? But I will tell you that it is not the case. حنبدا توا في جزئية البرزنتيشن أو التقديمية كان الهدف منها هو توعوي بحث حسب متطلبات الـ WFME كان المفروض أن الطالب يبيد أوير في global health issues فكان هدفنا في البرزنتيشن للطلبة في سنة أولى وسنة ثانية هو أن يغطي كل التوبكس اللي هي we are concerned in the medical field فحنبدا بطالبة ألاء عابد العلاقي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أنا اسمي ألا عبد العليقي and a second year medical student at the Faculty of Applied Medical Science. Today I'll be presenting to you about the effect of syphilis on the pregnancy outcomes. The learning objectives that I'd like for you to leave today with are to define syphilis, identify the causes and types of syphilis. Describe how syphilis reaches the fetus, outline the effect of syphilis on both the mother and her baby, and at the end we'll be able to list preventative and uh, treatment methods for the infection. So according to the World Health Organization, syphilis is the most common sexually transmitted infection, with about 6 million um, cases arising each year. Most of these cases tend to come from low uh, resource and financial uh, uh, countries, so the world, third world countries. Um, and it is the, most, uh, the second leading cause of stillbirth globally. The graph here shows that there's 47.8% uh, uh, of infected individuals are stillborn, so they die after 20 weeks of pregnancy. 20.9% um, uh, of the uh, infected babies are, uh, die after birth, and 31.3% of the infected individuals live but with various um, uh, health outcomes. Um, that I'll be talking about later. So what is syphilis? Syphilis is a sexually transmitted bacterial infection caused by a bacteria called Treponema pallidum. It's an anaerobic spiral sheet, so it's gram-negative, and it has a uh, spiral um, appearance under the microscope. 
Uh, syphilis may progress into two things. It could affect your cardiovascular system and cause cardiovascular syphilis, which causes an enlargement of the heart and may lead to heart failure. Or it could affect the brain and cause meningitis, which um, causes an inflammation of the meningeal layers of either the brain or the spinal cord. Um, all that being said, syphilis is preventable and treatable. So syphilis has three clinical stages. The primary syphilis is uh, characterized by formation of a uh, chancre, which is a painless uh, genital ulcer found both on the genitals of females and males. Uh, then it develops into an ulcer with serous exudate on the uh, mouth and the tongue. Uh, secondary syphilis is characterized by formation of mucus patches found on the soft and hard palate of the, uh, of the mouth, and it has a snail uh, track appearance, and it's the most uh, infectious stage. And tertiary syphilis is characterized by formation of a gamma, which is a, a granulomatous lesion mostly on the legs or sometimes on the arm, and it's non-contagious. Um, within the scope of syphilis, there's something known as congenital syphilis, which refers to uh, the baby being born with this infection, which they've acquired from their mother. Um, and there's two ways that this baby can acquire it. First, through the placenta, where the bacteria will uh, cross the placental barrier, enter the amniotic fluid, and infect the baby that way. Or through vaginal birth, when the baby is being born, they'll come in contact with the chancre that was uh, developed in the mother's primary phase. Um, and when they come in contact with it, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll acquire the bacteria that way. Now, the effect on the mother, she'll have various uh, symptoms, uh, ranging from headache, loss of hearing, visual impairment. Sometimes she'll lose uh, pain and temperature sensations, and it'll cause bladder incontinence, which is um, uh, involuntary uh, passage of urine. And it may lead to meningitis, stroke from the inflammation in the brain. So it causes a uh, reduction in oxygen to the, uh, to the brain, may cause uh, blindness, dementia, and uh, miscarriage, which is the death of the baby before uh, 20 weeks of pregnancy. The effects on the baby, uh, if, they, if they live through, uh, through birth, they'll, be, they'll, they'll either be um, deaf or sometimes they'll have teeth deformities. And there's two here. There's the Hutchinson's incisors, which is the photo, the photo on the left, and mulberry molars, which is the, uh, the second photo. Uh, saddle nose, which is caused by the loss of the nasal bridge, so the, their nose will be flat. Um, and enlarged liver or spleen, so uh, spleen or hepatomegaly. Um, and severe anemia of non-immune hemolytic type. Um, they'll also uh, have bone damage, jaundice due to the increased bilirubin in their blood, meningitis and rash, and it may lead to preterm birth, so the baby will be born before their due date, um, which will result in them having to, to stay in the NICU for, um, for a while, and then it could also cause stillbirth or neonatal death. So how do we avoid syphilis while pregnant? Uh, you should always go to prenatal checkups where the doctor will provide you with sc screening or te testing that could, um, that could detect the bacteria. And uh, once it's detected early, you'll, you'll, you'll receive your treatment. Um, also, after your prenatal checkup, you should always go to follow-up checkups, if you can, each month of your pregnancy. Um, you should restrain from sexual contact or activities while pregnant. And if you uh, engage, it should be protected. And you should also ask your partner to get tested. So how do we treat syphilis? Uh, it depends on the age of the individual. So baby from newborn till four weeks, they'll receive benzathine penicillin um, G at a five, uh, 50,000 units per kilogram per day, intravenously um, uh, every 12 hours. And older than four weeks up until adulthood, they'll receive the same antibiotic with the same dosage. But the older they get, the, uh, the higher the dosage will become. It could be given IV or intramuscularly. Um, if it's intravenous, it'll be every six hours. If it's intramuscularly, it'll be given once a week for three weeks. Um, the second antibiotic that can be given is procaine penicillin, but it's less recommended because benzathine pen penicillin is more um, effective. And it's given once daily for 20 days. 
Now, there's some individuals that have penicillin allergies, and depending on their doctor, they'll be um, given two choices, either undergoing an allergy desensitization uh, procedure, which will uh, result in them uh, receiving the, uh, the antibiotic without any uh, allergic reaction, or sometimes they'll be given an alternative antibiotic, which includes uh, doxycycline or tetracycline, but doxycycline is more common because it's uh, more tolerable within individuals. Um, so the, the one injection is given for the early stages, so primary and secondary, and then there's three doses for a three week period um, for late stage syphilis. And to conclude my presentation, um, I'd like to stress the importance of getting educated before getting pregnant uh, uh, on all the possible complications that may occur during the course of the pregnancy. I'd also like to stress the significance of routine checkups, even if you feel like there's nothing um, wrong with you because sometimes you can detect something that you never knew you had. And um, preg pregnancy is a complicated process that, in, uh, that has many different outcomes. So it's important that you're well oriented physically and mentally to endure the um, uh, responsibility that comes with, within the pregnancy period and afterwards. So these are my references. And thank you for listening. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Saman Mehdui, and today I'm going to be talking about mental health and its impact on physical health. So my objectives are introduction to mental health, the signs of positive mental health, the signs of mental illness, the link between mental health and physical health, and how can we pre prevent positive mental health. So beginning with the introduction to mental health, with a little bit of history. So long ago, mentally ill were considered to be possessed by the devils and were kept locked up far away in tall buildings till the 20th century when psychiatry finally began to emerge. Uh, when psychiatry finally began to emerge. So according to WHO, mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and is able to make a contribution to his and her community. So what are these signs of positive mental health? We have positive relationships, meaning and purpose, sense of accomplishment, emotional stability, optimism, and self-esteem. And what are these signs of mental illness? Feeling emotions deeply, extreme mood changes, inability to concentrate, withdrawal and detachment, insomnia, unhealthy eating habits, and last of all, substance abuse. So now that we know the short-term effects of mental health on our physical health, so what are the long-term effects of mental health on our physical health? Which brings me to my next objective, the link between mental health and physical health. So there's often a clear distinction made between mental health and physical health, but they should not be thought of as separate, they should be thought of as one as poor mental health can lead to poor physical health, and having poor mental health can negatively impact our bodies and can increase the risk of, uh, uh, can risk increase the risk of conditions. So there's a saying, the absence of a negative is not the same as the presence of a positive. And what this means is having factors such as happiness, optimism, and self-esteem can all help to reduce the risk of developing certain conditions regardless of predisposing factors. So beginning with CVS diseases, having depression and anxiety has been shown to promote CN, uh, CVS diseases. This is by increased risk of unhealthy diets or lifestyles. Increased uh, cortisol levels can lead to increased blood pressure and blood glucose levels. Increased risk of atherosclerosis, increased heart rate, and increased activity of platelets. Conversely, having ca cardiac diseases has been shown to have three times the risk of developing uh, mental health issues such as depression. Next is respiratory diseases. People with a mental illness have been shown to have an increased risk of developing chronic respiratory conditions such as COPD, which is constructive obstructive pulmonary disease. And this is mainly due to their increased uh, rates of smoking and nicotine uh, dependence because due to their depression and anxiety. 
Conversely, having chronic respiratory diseases has been shown to have elevated rates of, of individuals having anxiety and depression. Next is bone diseases. A study showed that schizophrenics have a reduced rate of getting atherosclerosis, uh, 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 arthritis, and this is due to genetics, anti-inflammatory drugs, side effects, as well as antipsychotic medications, as well as them living in a, a sedentary lifestyle in institutions. However, schizophrenics have an increased rate of getting low bone mass, and so in every one to two schizophrenics, one schizophrenic will develop osteoporosis. Last of all is cancer. High, high rates of cancer are found to be among people with schizophrenia. So people with schizophrenia have higher rates of getting gallbladder and bowel cancer, and this is due to them having a very high fat diet. And uh, conversely, people having, living with cancer are more prone to developing mental health issues such as depression, and this is due to the high levels of stress, changes in body image, as well as the emotional upset. So having a coexisting mental illness with cancer can interfere with the cancer treatment and uh, remission. So now that we know what mental health and how it impacts our health, how can we as a community try to maintain a positive mental health? We can start by to support the children and social support to elderly. As well, there are programs that target uh, vulnerable individuals such as minorities, and we also have, we should do mental health promotional activities in work and schools. Also, we decrease the violence, decrease poverty, and anti-discrimination laws and campaigns. So, to conclude, mental health is just as important as physical health. And in third world countries such as ours today, mental health is severely neglected. And so one of the goals of my presentation today is to give awareness of mental health and its importance. There's a saying by Dr. Veda, mental health is just as important as physical health. You would not dismiss broken bones, so please do not dismiss broken minds. These are my references. Thank you. الموضوع الثاني هو على Childhood Obesity اللي حجد مننا طالب محمد فتحي المجبري. Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen, my name is Muhammad Fatih Majbri and today my presentation is going to be talking about childhood obesity. So before we are getting into the main topic for today, I just want to tell you a little story which inspired me to choose this title specifically. Me as a growing child who really loved and enjoyed playing football with my friends in my neighborhood. Uh, and I think a lot of you were playing football just like me or even, or even more and playing football just was one thing that we all loved. And there is some kids that doesn't like, play, doesn't like playing football and enjoy the next, just the way we were. And if anyone asking who are they, this, uh, they are the children who consider it as obese. The reason behind this is, be, is because they have had an unspoken rule that made them stuck in the goalkeeper position. But it is then like the culture or a Libyan tradition. The fattest child always staying in the goalkeeper position. So this is making us as a duty for us to talk about their issue and give instructions, advices, and even solutions for, uh, for their problems. This uh, leading us to our objectives for today, defining childhood obesity and mention some statistics that related to it, and describe the childhood obesity risk factor, uh, outline disorders that related to the childhood obesity, and finally, list some ways to prevent the childhood obesity. So, according to the WHO, World Health Organization, the childhood obesity is a complex, preventable medical issue in society and it is measured by the BMI, the body mass index, which has a subdivided category. It can tell you if you are an underweight or normal or overweight, and even obese or extreme obese. And now we have some factors that relate to the childhood obesity. Uh, in fact, the prevalence of obesity in the United States has reached 17% of the children in, in the childhood, and about 38 million of the children under the age of five has been considered overweight or obese in the 2019. And the obesity prevalence has been uh, between the age two and 19 has been tripled in the past 20 years. 
and um, other uh, overweight adolescents had a 70% chance of becoming an overweight adult. And finally, the an overweight or uh, obese children and adolescents have a great risk of facing a social and physiological problems such as low self-esteem and bullying. So, if you are going to talk about the risk factors of the childhood obesity, there are multiple, in fact, such as the genetic risk factors, environmental risk factors, and behavior risk factors, and finally, certain medication. Starting with the genetic risk factors, they include the syndromes such as the brother willie syndrome. Uh, in fact, in this syndrome, the affected individuals will have uh, poor development and uh, weak muscle, and, but they will be always hungry and eating a lot of food. Uh, this is a picture of known case of brother willie syndrome, and I think we all can say he has uh, extreme obesity. Uh, uh, number two, we have the hormonal, such as the hypothalamic obesity. Uh, the hypothalamus is an important gland in the body which controls um, a lot of functions, such as the uh, sleep, drinking, eating, and even the temperature of the body. So if any problems happen to the hypothalamus, this will lead to the disturbance of its uh, function and may lead to severe and fast obesity. Then we have the monogenic, such as the leptin deficiency. In this case, the, the people who are affected with leptin deficiency will be, have, will be always hungry and consuming a lot of food. And it can be developing uh, obesity in the early life stages, and by this I mean in the early months of life. This, uh, this picture shows us a child who, is, who isn't really a one year, but she can't walk with her own, she can't stand with her own, and even she can't sit for more than 15 minutes. Uh, we have now the environmental risk factors. They include the food desserts, which means it is difficult to the parents or the people to get into a main store or a supermarket to get their essential and healthy food. Then we have increasing distance from the parks and playground. This increasing in the distance will be associated with increasing in the time that the children is that the children spend in the home watching TV or doing nothing maybe. Then we have the physical activity environment. This means if there are any sports club or anything that encourages the, the children to practice the, their sports or any type of the physical activity. Finally, we have the, uh, the parents' knowledge about food. If they are cooking a healthy food or if they are uh, just uh, eating hamburgers from the restaurants. Uh, then we have the behavior risk factors. They include the nutrition and diet. If, they are, if, they, if the children are really having uh, a lot of snacks or the sugar containing food, uh, this will be causing obesity in their lives. And obese parents. Actually, there are um, multiple studies that have been made for, for this purpose. They showed an even a non obese child who has been adopted from a both obese parents. This child is having a great risk of developing an obesity in their childhood. Well, then we have the sleep hours. Actually, uh, the here too, uh, multiple studies have made it clear a decreasing in the sleeping hours of the children will be associated with increasing in the risk of their development of the childhood obesity. Then we have the stress. Uh, the stress can cause uh, the stress can cause an obesity in the children. The type of the stress, uh, of the stress may be in home or familial type or even in, in school. And there are certain medications, such uh, certain medications, as we well, talked about earlier, they can make, they can develop a childhood obesity in the children. Now we have some disorders related to the childhood obesity. We have the cardiovascular diseases, such as the heart disease and the stroke. Both of them are the leading of this in 2018. And then we have the musculoskeletal disorders, such as the osteoarthritis. Then we have the diabetes mellitus. Then we have uh, many cancers, such as the breast cancer, prostate cancer, and liver cancer, and a gallbladder cancer. Actually, I have made a question here and asked about 120 people if they knew someone who has a childhood obesity. 
80% of the answers were yes. I continued asking if they were if they are not having any health problems or they are healthy, and there is the answer. About 25.7% of them were not having any problems and they are healthy, and we are, we are all happy for them. And, but 20.2% of them having a cardiovascular problems and 11% of them having a respiratory problems, 20.2% having a diabetes. And 17.4 having a gastrointestinal problems, and finally about 5.5% of them having a hypertension. So talking about the risk factors and the diseases, this leads us to the important question: How can we prevent the childhood obesity? Actually, the prevention of the childhood obesity is, isn't impossible, but it is a function of two entities: the familiar rule and the uh, environmental intervention. So the familiar rule, it's uh, actually there are multiple ways, but we are going to list some of them by uh, limiting the total amount of the sugar that is provided to the children, provide to the children an adequate amount of water, vegetables, fruit, and a healthy food, and uh, reduce the TV hours and uh, and then uh, make sure that your children is getting enough hours of sleep. Finally, try a non-food reward if they, uh, if they, let's say, uh, have made their homework or anything that requires a reward. And then we have the, the, inter uh, the environmental intervention. So, uh, it's, it may be uh, providing a sports club for the children and uh, providing a healthy food in the stores and the schools, publishing articles that, uh, about the seriousness of the childhood obesity. So, in conclusion, the childhood obesity is a serious, preventable problem and it may be developed uh, into the adulthood causing a severe problems and disorders. And its risk factors, I mean the risk factors of the childhood obesity, are really linked to uh, many sides of our normal life. And, uh, and the prevention of it sh should be made by the family and the society together. This is my references for today. And the presentation has been made under the supervision of Dr. Rehan Labidi. Thank you all for your time. My name is Namia Hani Benghazi, second year medical student. Nowadays, I want to talk about effect of HIV in maternal and child health. Uh, I want to talk about the story, my Jennifer. Uh, in a lonely moment, specifically 2030, Jennifer's life changed forever. While your mother was sick and reviewed to the hospital, finally she asked him if she has HIV positive, and she answered yes. The worst thing, she was suffering from the virus before 18 years old breath her daughter and have not undergone any treatment. After her diagnosis of the virus, her husband kicked out from the house and nowhere to go. Then she returned home and she dies after a few weeks. Her daughter suffering from many psychological and social problems after her death in mother and nowhere to go. Then she didn't have material to go to school. Then after 2060, she was 21 years old and her father afraid because her daughter didn't marry and have children because, uh, because infected with HIV. The main reason of the message or this story, who your mother hide the disease. So you shouldn't hide the virus or the disease because it affects your life and all your family life, like what happened to the Jennifer family. Objective. Define of HIV, describe infected or infected mother with HIV, discuss the effect HIV on the child, then describe effect of HIV on the psyche of the child. Let's think HIV pregnant women can do. Definition of HIV, what is HIV? HIV is the humoral immune deficiency virus. It's the virus that attacks the body and the immune complex. HIV and AIDS are not the same thing. If HIV cannot treat, can lead to AIDS. Acquire immune deficiency syndrome. This infected mother with HIV. Uninfected mother. Motherhood is difficult for all mother, but less is likely experience stress than HIV infected mother. 
infected mother. Stress about passing HIV or baby during pregnancy. This is feeling are more complex with women HIV. Feeling, feeling sad because uh, didn't breastfeeding your baby. Concerned about the safety the will treatment will receive during a pregnancy. Concerned about how to, to, how to take care yourself during a pregnancy and how keep your baby safe. This is feeling are more complex with women with HIV and we can add stress after pregnancy. HIV can pass it from mother to child any time during a pregnancy. Child breath and breastfeeding, this is called parental transmission. Discuss the effect HIV on the child. Education. Many HIV affect children cannot continue to go to school because their family cannot afraid to school. Their family need them to work, need them to go home and contribute to the family income. Nutrition. Many children don't have enough nutrition. They might eat rice, beckles, noodles because of the poverty. The worst thing in the world, the poverty. Psyche of the child. HIV often deal with psychological stress and all her gave a reduced parental capacity. This challenge can lead to emotional and behavior stress as depression. Previous studies have recognized children from HIV affected family more prone to that developing disorder as social adjustment, attention, problem and depression. You can share all things with family. You can eat together, yeah. You can share the same toilet because HIV transmission by blood. Most children with diagnosis parental HIV are black African. Uganda and most of the country have children with HIV. Think HIV pregnant women can do. Visit your health care, then take HIV medicine. The risk transmission, one percentage or less is a few. Um, and reduce serene delivery. Don't breastfeed in your baby. Percentage on child to transmission 2017, 19 percentage Malawi and South Africa, 17, 89 percentage Kenya and Tanzania, 15, 69 percentage India, uh, India, less 50 Nigeria. My conclusion, education appears to be the most effective way to reduce the number of people who are suffering from the virus or die HIV and AIDS. Pregnant women and children should do good management to have a better life. This is my referencing. Thank you for listening to me. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Ahmed Fajani and today I'm presenting my title related to our main topic which is smoking cessations and uh, symptoms of nicotine withdrawal which is considered one of the most important and broad subjects around the world. So here are my objectives. I will first define tobacco and also I will list the causes of smoking diseases, outline the signs and symptoms of nicotine withdrawal, and uh, the last objective here, I will list the side effect of smoking cessations alternatives. So uh, the definition of tobacco or uh, as a basic overview about tobacco or how can we define tobacco, um, tobacco is a plant found nearly all around the world is what discovered uh, 8,000 years ago uh, by Native Americans and start cultivation at uh, five years ago, uh, five years before uh, Christ. Um, uh, uh, the American people think uh, that this plant can help every problem and disease found in our uh, bioactive body, uh, and uh, also uh, they start using it in religion ceremonies. So uh, the clinical diseases that is associated of smoking tobacco, uh, first we have cardiovascular diseases and uh, increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness, uh, loss of pulmonary function, and uh, the last, or point number four here, we have pathologic changes of emphysema. So uh, nicotine withdrawal, uh, nicotine withdrawal meaning is the signs and symptoms that appear physically and mentally on, uh, on the smoker after he start to quit smoking, okay? And then we have the side of symptoms that uh, uh, firstly appear after quitting smoking, which is the first one here, we have appetite. Uh, appetite is uh, the desire to eat uh, food, which is considered to be the first uh, signs, uh, the first symptoms that appear on a smoker after quitting smoking. Uh, the second one here, we have nicotine craving. Um, nicotine craving is uh, also considered a powerful desire of a nicotine. Those and this symptoms actually uh, start uh, if the smoker cuts off the dose of nicotine suddenly. Uh, 
And point number three here, we have coughing. Um, as we all know, as a doctors, we have, we have a microorganelles found in our respiratory tract, which is uh, uh, called the cilia. So the function of these cilia is to clear out the accumulated uh, substance and uh, uh, the accumulated substance that found in our uh, respiratory system. So uh, when you stop uh, smoking or when you decide to quit smoking, uh, these cilia will reactivate and work again uh, yani normally and then uh, the accumulated substances will, uh, will start to be cleared out of our uh, respiratory system and as a result of as a result as a result of the, as a result of this a coughing, a coughing might happen to the uh, to the smoker uh, point number four here we have uh, headache. Um, this point uh, exactly happened uh, due to an increased level of adrenaline and as we all know adrenaline uh, cause uh, uh, a vasoconstriction to our blood vessels especially uh, uh, the, uh, the blood vessels uh, which is uh, around uh, the brain. So uh, uh, as a result of this vasoconstriction the speed of the blood circulatory around the brain will, uh, will increase and uh, a severe, uh, the, the smoker after quitting, after, after quitting smoking might face a severe headache. The last two points here we have anxiety and anger. Actually these two points uh, related to uh, two main hormones found in our uh, body which is dopamine and serotonin. Uh, these two hormones are uh, responsible for giving uh, the good mood and uh, like the amazing mood that the smoker uh, found while he's smoking. So when you cut the dose of nicotine, uh, these two hormones will disturb in secretion in our body. Already published, Yani. Uh, application of electronic health record list in all clinics. Barriers and benefits. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're having a good day on Ramadan Mubarak. I would like to introduce myself first. My name is Salma Lahresh, health informatics graduate and tutor at Libyan International Medical University. I'm honored to present my paper, which is titled Application of Electronic Health Records in Polyclinics, Barriers and Benefits. Those are the contents of my presentation, starting with the introduction and finally ending with the conclusion. The visible advance in information technology in the past two decades changed how we look into things especially in the field of health. A lot of change happened that improved the quality of health and opened the door for enlargement. One example of the enlargement is using electronic health records. The process of moving to a paperless environment has plenty of benefits. For example, it can improve the quality and uh, accuracy of data, but also it has a lot of benefits. We will discuss in, a future, uh, in the presentation. Before we go in depth, I would like to define what is EHR or electronic health records. It's a digital version of patient paper chart. EHR is a real-time patient-centered data that makes information accessible to authorized users at any place or time. As we said, there's a lot of barriers that affect the implementation process. Uh, those barriers are categorized in five categories. Uh, the, uh, the financial barriers, technical barriers, ethical and legal barriers, social barriers, and finally the organizational barriers. Uh, as we know, the health sector is an area of economic and social interests, and any change in it can affect the general economy. One of, uh, one of the improvements that can be done is implementing EHR system, but in Libya there is no available data about this system at all. Our study aims to take the first step uh, toward an EHR system by investigating the extent of some of the important barriers that can emerge by implementing it. Our objectives consist of three, identifying the important barriers, ranking the barriers, and measuring the perception of uh, the healthcare providers. Uh, scriptive analytical studies, studies were applied in this research. Uh, the study uh, population consists of 100 volunteers from El Kish Polyclinics. Uh, the data, uh, we collected the data using an anonymous questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire is composed from three sections, the demographic data, knowledge and attitude, and benefits and fears. 
Uh, in the gender distribution, 59% of our uh, population consists of females and 41% uh, consists of male. Uh, the healthcare profession distribution, the highest pro proportion were for physicians with 33% and uh, the least percent was for nurses with 15%. 57% of our sample population uh, agreed that there's a huge problem in the current manual paper record. And 47% of, uh, of our population uh, knows a few things about the EHR system or electronic health record system. In the categories we talked about, the first one, the financial barriers, 52% of our sample population agreed that, agreed that the implementation of this type of system is very expensive. And 45% uh, agreed that the maintenance is too expensive too. These results were consistent with a paper published by the Medical Record Institution of America in 2005. In the legal and ethical barriers, 63% uh, agreed that the security of patient medical information is a major problem. This result was inconsistent with a study made in 2011, uh, and, when we, and we figured that this inconsistency because 41% uh, of our participants were not very familiar with legal and ethical consequences. And the technical barriers for 45% of the of our sample population agree that there is not necessary infrastructure in the facility to implement to implement such system. Also, 49% of our uh, of our participants uh, reported that the system will be more useful in transmitting patient information between facilities. Uh, social barriers, the participants agreed that 48% of, uh, of them, uh, of the facilities, do not have the necessary employee to keep up with, the, with such system. But in the bright side, 17% of the participants agreed to improve their computer skills to keep up with such system. Finally, the organizational barriers, which is the least important barriers in our list, uh, one example of uh, organizational barrier is senior management support, which from our participant point of view, 48% of, uh, of the participants think that the, the facility will support such, will support, uh, such system. In conclusion, the use of EHR system is recommended to increase the quality, and, uh, the quality of uh, healthcare. Uh, it's uh, one of the most important things is to identify the important barriers. Uh, the study shows that the lack of knowledge about EHR system and unawareness of such uh, system is a huge barrier. We list the, uh, the barriers that could uh, affect the implementation process. The financial barriers and uh, technical barriers were top on our list. Uh, and organization and security barriers were among the least important barriers. Also, the lack of knowledge uh, of English language and computer skills is a huge problem, but proper training is necessary to effectively, uh, to effectively implement this in the, uh, in the future. The results will assist the policymakers in implementing such a system. The adoption of EHR may take a long time, but it will improve the, the quality of care in, in the future run. Extra effort need to be made to successfully implement this system. Uh, but on the bright side, most healthcare systems are aware of such systems, so it won't be very hard for them to implement it. Further studies can investigate more into these barriers in order to determine uh, a proper solution to, uh, to solve them. Those are the references for our paper, and thank you all for your attention. <laughs> I'm going to present this paper uh, investigating the impact of different data representation uh, with several classifier models on MRI images. So, uh, data mining uh, is the process of, uh, is part of the proce KDD process, knowledge discovering database, and we can define data mining is, as uh, the process of extracting and discovering patterns in large data sets. And uh, this science uh, is the intersection of uh, statistics and machine learning and database systems. There are two types of data mining, namely predictive and descriptive data mining. 
Predictive data mining aims to build a model from historical data in order to forecast future values. So data mining, higher classification accuracy, that means the, 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 the more uh, our model is reliable. So uh, usually most researchers, when they do uh, their research, they travel through several classifier models and they didn't look for data representations. And even if they use normalization, they use only one type of normalization. So changing to other type of normalizations may affect the accuracy, the classification accuracy, with higher or not. So the aim of this paper was investigating the impact of different data representations on several classifier models technique on the chosen data sets. And uh, to uh, conduct this experiment and to prove this hypothesis, so we choose that the Heimer data sets is internationally and commonly used by many researchers. It's available online. And uh, Alzheimer is one of the dementia diseases that affect elderly people who are beyond 65 years old. Uh, and Alzheimer diagnosis relies on the MRI images and CDR. This data set consists of 15 attributes, and the class target was demented, non-demented, and converted. Then uh, we choose four normalization techniques, uh, very famous, uh, min-max normalization, z-score normalization, and decimal scaling and standard deviation. So we apply these normalizations on the data sets that we have. So we have the as-is data sets, and we apply these uh, normalizations, the four normalizations that we choose on the same data sets. And this is an example of the same attribute with the same value uh, after the normalizations. We can see here the effect of the, uh, that happening on the attributes and the value after we apply these normalizations. So the result from this, this stage also, we have got five uh, data sets. Then we choose uh, six classifiers, uh, some of them uh, from the background of computer science and some of them from the background of statistics. So we choose naive bias, neural network, classification tree, heuristic regression, support vector machine, and k-nearest neighbors. And all this is very commonly used to build a predictive model that uh, we talked about. Then uh, to conduct this experiments, uh, uh, as a result, we have uh, five, uh, five data sets, as is then the four normalization data sets. And we have six uh, classification techniques, so we conduct 30 experiments, and we collect uh, 30 classification accuracy from these experiments. And this is uh, the architecture that we use on the orange data mining software to conduct these experiments. So as a result, uh, uh, this is the table, and we have the, uh, the six uh, classification techniques, and we have here the five uh, uh, data representation that we use, and we can see that, uh, for example, when we apply k nearest neighbor with the as is the representations, we get only 49.1% per, uh, classification accuracy. That means this model will predict the future value only 49%, and the rest is wrong, so uh, this is very poor classification accuracy. And after we change the data representation for this, uh, uh, for example, if we can see the k-nearest neighbor after we change with the z-score normalizations, it's, we, we, we achieve 88%, so the, the, the performance of the model is uh, improved, even it's uh, the same data sets and the same values, just changing the representation with these uh, values. And uh, we can also observe that uh, the highest classification accuracy ever achieves when we apply the logistic regressions uh, from st the statistical background uh, with z-score normalization, so uh, with 91.2%. Uh, so, uh, in general, uh, the researchers who want to build the classification models and he used only the as is data representations and it didn't change for normalization. He will never get the 91% uh, because 91% is only achieved after we change the representations. So findings, we can observe that 
uh, data representation has improved the classification accuracy, and this is very important for all researchers not all over the world. And uh, only if we take one example, the key nearest neighbors, it's uh, we achieve the poorest uh, when we apply as is data representation, with, which is 49.1%, uh, and. Uh, uh, the best classification accuracy achieved when we apply z-score normalization with 88.2%. And this is a 39.1 difference uh, or improved in the classification accuracy with the same classification techniques. Uh, also, uh, we cannot claim that neural network and FBIs achieve the highest degree of classification overall uh, on, on, on these datasets. And uh, also, if we take the percentage between the poorest classification accuracy and the best classification accuracy ever achieved in this experiment, so uh, it's a difference 42.1% uh, from the key nearest neighbors until the logistic regression with the z score normalizations. So, to conclude, uh, normalizations. Uh, uh, of the data sets has improved the predictive and accuracy of the machine learning. And this is agreed with other studies that uh, we'll uh, It cannot be claimed that naive behaviors in your talk will be useful for every application we use only, uh, we can say only for this type of data sets that converted from images to uh, attributes. As is data representation in this case behaved as the boros comparing to the others if we exclude support victim machines and that uh, classification give a, a good result. Uh, normalizing the original data using this core technique proved if we, if we look to the uh, other data representations, this core uh, always uh, give higher accuracy uh, regarding uh, the classification accuracy uh, from these data sets. Thank you for listening. And I'm a graduate from the uh, Faculty of Business Administration, specifically the Department of Finance and Banking. Uh, and today I will be discussing my graduation project, which is the impact of stock market on economic growth. So these are my contents, which I included in my graduation project. However, today's presentation will be a little bit shorter for the time. So as an introduction, basically we all know that stock markets nowadays are very crucial for the uh, growth of uh, the country's economy and its development. However, like any other research topic, there are controversies between researchers whether that impact is positive or negative, and this is what I'm aiming for to investigate in my research topic, uh, whether the uh, impact of the stock market has a positive or a negative effect. Uh, so I chose to do my uh, to do my research on the Gulf countries, which are the, which are the GCC countries, uh, due to the fact that their economy is the most similar one to a Libyan economy, which is an oil-based economy. Uh, my research objectives were first to uh, examine whether that impact is positive or negative, and which variable had the most effect from the variables that I chose, and to provide policy implications to. Um, to create a diversified economy for the GCC countries. So based on my literature review, which I conducted, I collected 20 research papers, and I found that 85% of the papers from all around, uh, all around the world of the, um, of the continent, that 85% actually had a positive impact, that the stock market affected the economy uh, positively. And only 15%, which were mainly from still developing countries or very uh, poor countries, had a negative impact of their stock market. So uh, the data that I collected were from the World Bank Outlook, uh, and I gathered the data from the year of 1993 till 2019. 
I chose three dependent variables, which are the GDP uh, growth, the real GDP, and the GDP per capita, which were representing the uh, economic uh, development of the country. And then I also chose four uh, independent variables, which uh, I was investigating their effect on the dependent variables. I chose the market capitalization, the stock turnover ratio, total value of listed shares, and the number of listed shares. Those were the variables that were um, representing the stock market. I also added two dummy variables to see whether they had an impact uh, or an effect on that specific topic, which were the political, uh, political, capital, uh, political stability. Uh, or the political conflict, and the uh, GFC, which is the global financial crisis. And lastly, I added an oil rent variable because, uh, like I said, it's an oil-based uh, economy, so I wanted to see whether it also had an effect or not. Uh, so, like I said, the data that I collected were from 1993 till 2019, and based on that, I formed three equations to test the three different dependent variables, the real GDP, GDP growth, and GDP per capita. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, the methodology that I went about, first I uh, ran all variables through a correlation test. Basically, the correlation test is to see whether the variables are, um, had an effect on each other, the independent variables, because uh, to, do the, um, to do that investigation, I need to be sure that all my independent variables are not dependent on each other or are not affected by each other. So after the correlation test, I, um, I ran all variables into a linear regression or the OLS method to, uh, to see whether that effect was positive or negative, like I said. So because I found that uh, there were actually correlation between the variables, instead of dropping the whole variable out of the research, I created uh, eight models to investigate um, to investigate the regression, and in each model, like it's shown here, there are different sets of variables to see which model had the most effect. So this was the one for the real GDP, this were the empirical results of the GDP growth, and these were the empirical results of GDP per capita. And based on those, uh, I came to the conclusion or the key findings that uh, the stock turnover ratio had the most effect on the real gross domestic product, and the variable oil rent, which is not a stock market variable, however, it had a real um, positive impact on the gr gross domestic product growth. And lastly, the listed uh, companies represented as LS had a negative impact on the GDP per capita, which could be um, a reason due to, the, uh, due to the listed companies of the stock markets on the GCCs were actually not very efficient and mainly government, uh, governmental companies, so their impact on the stock market itself were not as efficient. Uh, however, from that I could conclude that uh, there was actually an impact or a positive impact from the stock market on the economic uh, growth of the, G of the GCCs because the two strongest variables had a positive impact. Uh, so the implications which I came up from my, uh, from my research that policymakers need to actually change from an oil-based economy to a market-based economy because oil is not um, a renewable source and thus depending or the, a whole economy depending on it is not beneficial for the long run. Uh, as well as that my study, um, if soon maybe, or the government of, uh, of Libya wants to change or wants to um, transform our economy from an oil base to a market base, which will be beneficial for our country, they could take this, um, take this research as a, um, as a reference. However, my limitations, like I said, there was a lack of research papers on that certain region, so I had to uh, take my papers from different countries, from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, and try to, um, try to combine them, the methods they used. Uh, and my results might not reflect the reality as accurately as possible because I only chose four variables to represent the stock market, and there were some variables neglected, like the price, uh, or the oil price or inflation rates. And lastly, a comparison between the results could not have been done because I only used the OLS uh, or the ordinary least square method to examine the regression, so I could not compare between them. Uh, and lastly, that it is only on a national level of the GCC and not on, on an international level. Thank you for your attention.
في رابط هينزل في مليون لعلمي على مجموعة الواتس بتاع الجامعة أتمنى أن كل المشاركين اليوم يستخدموه في التقييم ويا ريت ممثل الكليات كل واحد يحاول يستخدمه للطلاب بتاعينا اللي هو العلمي تمام ومشكورين جدا جدا شكرا للجميع شكرا لطلاب وأعضاء هيئة التدريس اللي شاركوا في إحياء هذا العلمي ب تقديم اوراق علميه وشكرا جزيلا ايضا اللي تحملوا حوالي اربع ساعات وذا مش سهله في رمضان في هذا الوقت طبعا لم يخلو الامر من ان بعض الناس ما اخذوا غفوتهم يعني في اليوم مش محتاجين يعني في اللي بيتروع على طول على المطبخ ما فيش داعي نمزح طبعا شكرا للجان المنظمة ممثلي الكليات شكرا لأنس اللي تحمل مسؤولية مسؤولية كثيرة دعوة لاجتماعاتها ومتابعة عملها وال... أيضا شكرا للزملاء العمداء وكلاء الجامعة ولعل أن هذه كانت فرصة للاستفادة لتطوير هذا العمل أكد أن السنة القادمة حيكون بصورة أفضل طبعا لا شك أن طلب المشاركين بالتحديد أظهروا مهارة كبيرة في في التواصل في تقديم أوراقهم وهكذا هم طلبة الجامعة الدولية دائماً <تصفيق>